Okay, first things first, our series on the study of the book of Haggai. Last week, we started the series and uh, Pastor Jess uh, shared with us our top five priorities. Do you remember the top five priorities that we should be embracing as a CCFer? Anyone remember? Parang wala. Were you here last week? It's an anniversary last week. All right, you are all quiet. <laughs> Which is our first priority? What is our first priority? Number one is God, and secondly, our spouse. Next is our children, and the fourth one is either work or ministry. And lastly, we shared that uh, friends sometimes is our priority. And if we uh, <clears throat> consider this very seriously, the position of our hands should be like this. Because this is God, this is your spouse, this is your children, this is your work and ministry, these are your friends. You cannot overturn it. Otherwise, you fail. You are not practicing the right priorities in your life. So friends, also, Pastor Jess shared with us the four uh, points that we can practice as we... <clears throat> pursue our right priorities. Number one is the prioritizing God's plan. Prioritize God's perspectives. Remember that? And then prioritize performing God's will and prioritize seeking God's presence. So, in, in Haggai, we learn all about these things. And, and if we uh, review our timeline of the study of the book of Haggai, this is uh, what was presented to us last week. 586 BC, where the Jews were exiled to Babylon or the present-day Iraq. And then, uh, in 538 BC, uh, they were to return from exile. It was uh, recorded in Israel chapter 3. And then in 536 BC, we, they started the rebuilding of the temple. Okay? But then, in 530 BC, the rebuilding of the second temple started. Top. And that's where the problem was. But in, uh, as we you know, continue with the timeline, in 520 BC, Haggai delivers his first message. And if we continue with the timeline once again, 515 BC, it's the completion of the second temple. It's recorded in Israel chapter 8, verse 15. So, friends, let us recall that <clears throat> in 530 BC, this was where the problem started because they stopped rebuilding the second temple. Uh, 16 years had passed uh, when Haggai delivered the message, but six years when they started, uh, immediately they stopped. So that was the time that the foundation uh, was already uh, in place. However, it had overgrown with weeds the vision of the people had slowly faded away. What was the vision? Because Haggai's prophetic task was to call the people of God to worship in the temple, in the new temple that uh, will be placed in Jerusalem. So he was to rekindle that vision in the minds of the people and the hearts of the people and their leaders as well. And yet, these people... We, uh, Haggai, wants them to move towards obedience to God's word. Friends, let us all recall that the reason why they were exiled is because of their disobedience. They disobeyed God. It was a sin. So, friends, it's one thing to get God's people back to work and quite another to keep them on the job. Just like when we are in the ministry, when we are in the ministry, and according to Dr. Bob Jones Sr., the greatest ability a person can possess is dependability. You know, some of us can start uh, very strong in the ministry. Some of us can be very fiery, on fire, you know, when they join a music ministry, or any particular ministry uh, that they started joining, they will be so much so high that they are always they're doing God's work. 
the start. However, however, when things go wrong or when things are not going well in their lives, they became complacent and then for whatever reason, they fell out of love, the ministry, or probably even their love for God and they will eventually leave the ministry. But too often, uh, too often friends, uh, potential workers excuse themselves and they say, Here I am, Lord. Send him. That's always been the problem, right? Whenever we are tasked to do something, we point to somebody. That's the reason why we would like to discuss this uh, Haggai chapter 2 verses 1 to 9. So, for the returning Jews to Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple was actually a very special task for them. For it meant for them to restore the true worship in Jerusalem. No, they were in the they were in exile. Makes it lang naman na panahon, 70 years lang. Okay, they were in exile for 70 years. And so completing the project would please the Lord. And it will be a great testimony in their neighboring unbelieving uh, nations who were watching the remnant in Jerusalem. So Haggai delivered actually, uh, according to uh, Dr. Warren Wiersbe, five brief messages to encourage the laborers to complete their assignment. What was the assignment once again? To rebuild the temple. So in his message, he asked them to look for a specific direction to learn what God, what God, wanted them to learn. So, this afternoon, friends, uh, today, the lesson is, when discouraged, fix your eyes on God. Let me first ask you, what are the causes of discouragement? Probably first, in priority, is a relationship problem. Relationship. How many of you here doesn't have any relationship problem at all? Raise your hands. Every one of us has experienced one. One way or the other. No? I remember, <clears throat> no, in CCF kasi, we always uh, talk about, who, who is my GB? Who is my GB material? I pray for him, I pray for her. No, I'd like to, to pursue this person. Okay? Because I think my life will be happy. My life would be complete if I pursue this person. However, when you get to marry that person, you will find out that you will be more happy. Okay? That's the beauty of being in a CCFA. Right? You'll be more happy. But the reality is, friends, there are some, there are some young couples in CCF that we've counseled barely a year in their married life they want to return their spouse to their parents. Gusto na isoli yung kandila. No, because of some petty issues that they cannot settle. Because as you know, friends, sometimes no, we think that the person is so mature in faith, that's uh, how he or she presented himself or herself, and yet by the time that you are already living together as married couple, then you get to know the person better. Right? So, relationship can cause discouragement. Next is health and sickness problem. Especially so when you, uh, when your loved ones, deeply uh, loved ones, are so sick, you prayed for healing. And yet, at the end of the day, God will take him, take her from your family. I remember uh, eight years ago, my mother suffered from a massive uh, heart attack and she was uh, in the ICU for several months. And it, is our, it was our prayer to, for her to be healed. Yet, she died. Was I discouraged? No. Because I know she's in a better place. That God answered our prayer. That she suffered no more. And then, nine months after, my dad, because of uh, maxillary bone can- cancer, died also of cancer. Was I discouraged? 
No. Because I know that my dad is in a better place. Two years after, my father-in-law was also diagnosed with cancer. And he died. Even though we prayed for healing. Prayed for healing. So friends, there are a lot of times that uh, when we pray, when we ask God in prayer for healing of our loved ones, ultimately God answer is really, probably for some, He will take him or her back in heaven. That's the reality. That's the reality. I remember also one of the teachings, uh, one of the lessons of Pastor Jonathan that he gave us in GLC. Friends, the perfect health and wealth and wisdom, you will only experience that in heaven. I cling on to that. Because I know that God loves my parents. God loves your loved ones more than you do. So, yun. And then what else? Death in the family, as I mentioned. Then financial problems. How many of you here haven't experienced any financial problems at all? Raise your hands. We all did. Right? We all did. No, one way or the other, one time or the other, we have experienced that. But you know, probably we are all experiencing this. The scariest. Meet Judith. No, every 15th and 30th of the month. No, Judith is diba, knocking on your door. Okay? Judith. No, you know Judith? No, there are times, especially for us, yung mga hindi po nakakawa, pakibulong na lang doon sana. <coughs> there are times, no, that before the 15th and the 30th, we call it the Pecha de Peligro. No? It used to be, you, you're eating in a very fancy restaurant, but pagdating na ng Pecha de Peligro, Jollibee na lang. 50 pesos lang, pwede na. No? Financial problems. And then, next, probably, we're just too tired and weary about all of the things that are happening in our lives. Work, ministry, everything. So we're just tired and weary, you're discouraged. So friends, uh, disappointments can lead to discouragement. And discouragement will lead to disinterest. You become disinterested. So if you're discouraged with your boss, if you're discouraged with your job, if you're discouraged with uh, your career, chances are you will be disinterested. No, You will report for work late. You will be absent from time to time. You will not submit reports, etc., etc. Because you became so disinterested. And therefore... You are living a life, a defeated life. Defeated life. So, we are discouraged when our present situation or actual experiences are way of tangent relative to your expectation. So, you have probably have set a very high standard or very high expectation for yourself and you ended up putting so much pressure on you. You became so hard on yourself Friends, you know, oppositions, disappointments, uh, discouragement will certainly come to all of us. The wave of discouragement comes to all of us in various ways and various times. It's just a matter of what is your perspective in dealing with discouragement and disappointments. So going back again to the timeline, so as we see, the start of the rebuilding of the temple is in Ezra chapter 3. To 4, 536 BC, we understand from the previous slides that Haggai was a member of the older generation and had seen the temple before it was destroyed. And then some of the older men had looked back in sorrow as they remembered the glory and beauty of Solomon's temple. So, in fact, it was recorded in Israel chapter 3, verse 12a. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. So they were so sad. They wept. Umiyak po sila. Why? Because in Solomon's temple, ganyan po itsura. And then the, uh, the, the, new, the second temple that they have to rebuild is the Zerubbabel's temple, ganyan na itsura. So imagine, you're part of that generation. You, you've seen the splendor of the original one and then you compare it to the second one, you will probably be feeling bad. 
Sometimes in our lives, ganon. When we had so much so in our lives, when we are, I would say, we are uh, financially in good standing, and then discouragements, disappointments came into your life, some trials and long suffering, then you will end up building your second temple different from the original one. So Haggai certainly uh, didn't weep with the rest of the elders, with the rest of his peers. He rejoiced that the work had begun, and he wanted to see it completed. Why? Because instead of being discouraged, he focused his eyes on God. So the humble temple, the Jewish remnant, was constructing would not last. They know that. And even during Herod's time, the refurbished or the uh, pinaganda, na beautified second temple that they rebuilt would be destroyed in 22 BC by the Roman Empire. And that they also believe, based on the prophecy of Haggai, that there would one day be a glorious temple that nobody could destroy or defile. I will explain that further later. But you know, I like what Dr. Warren Wiersbe said. It is better to fail in an endeavor that you know will ultimately succeed than to succeed in an endeavor you know will ultimately fail. Nice, right? How do we unpack this? Probably for some of you, businessmen, no? you enter into a business that you think is not glorifying to God. And yet you will pursue because you think you will be successful. You fail to realize that the other should be the one you're pursuing. You can fail at first. You may probably go through a lot of challenges before you become successful in the business. Probably in the corporate life, it will be the same thing. No? For some, uh, they are like vacuum cleaner. No? Sip, sip, sa boss para maging successful. But for others, they would really go through the steps. They would really climb the corporate ladder according to their abilities, according to the merits of their work. And it can also be uh, talking about finding your God's best. Now, for some of the singles, even unbelievers, they will pursue the relationship because they think, last trip ko na brother eh. Liebo 50 na ako eh. Yung mga older people na rin yung liebo. No, no. So, no, ah, this is my last trip. So, okay na yan. I will evangelize him or her once we are inside the church. You will fail. You will, yung nga pare yung believer eh. They are having hard time in a marriage set up. How much more if you marry someone who is an unbeliever? Friends, today, when discouraged, fix your eyes on God. So, excuse us for the ano, no, uh, mistype ano doon sa, sa chronicle. No? When discouraged, fix your eyes on God. So, again, Haggai, rather than ignore the problem of uh, discouragement that was sure to come when the people contrasted the two temples. Again, comparing the old from the new. The prophet Haggai faced the problem head on. Though, interestingly, no, some of us, we always compare ourselves to others. Especially so, if someone you know, very close to you, very successful in the corporate life, in the business, you tend to compare yourselves. Or even in the ministry, no, you compare yourselves to someone who has Ang dami niyang D-group. Ang dami niyang downline. E ikaw wala. Kahit upline. Meaning, di ka pa membro ng, ano, ng D-group. No? So, bakit ka may inggit? Now, seriously speaking, friends, we can only compare ourselves to God and God alone. We have no business comparing ourselves with others. Okay? So, again, interestingly, Haggai pick an important day on which he chose to give his third message. No, actually, it's third message. But as, second pa lang tayo. No? Uh, Haggai 2 one says, In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai 
the prophet. So what is the significance of this day? What was the occasion? You know, friends, this day in the month of Tishri corresponds to October 17, 520 BC. So what? But friends, this is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booth. Uh, as indicated in Leviticus chapter 23, verses uh, 39 to 40. I will not read that anymore. So, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles is a feast to celebrate God's provision for Israel when they were wandering no, in the wilderness for very short time period lang, 40 years lang. No? And they give thanks during this feast for a bountiful harvest. Remember the story of Jesus when the boy Jesus in Luke chapter 2 when he was seen in the temple discussing with the Pharisees and the scribes because yun, ang ginagawa nila, they were studying the book, the scriptures. No? Yan yung ginagawa nila doon. So, on this occasion, the Lord gave Haggai the third message. So, it is actually uh, in 520 BC. No? The important thing about this date was this. It was during the Feast of the Tabernacle that King Solomon dedicated the original temple. Yun po yung importance doon. And Haggai wanted the people to think about that. That the restored building had nothing of the splendor of Solomon's temple and yet it was still God's house. It was still God's house. Built according to His plan and for His glory. So probably some of us uh, have left a previous ministry that you were so much involved with and then later on you come back. It's a different already. You know, the setup is so much different than the original. Then we tend to compare. Then we are afraid now. So how can I cope up with the new ministry? So we became uh, disinterested or probably discouraged. Iba na. Hirap na. Bumalik pa naman ako. But we have to understand, friends, that the same ministry would be performed no? just like in the temple at its altars and the same worship presented to the Lord. So times may change, but ministry goes on. Ministry goes on. And uh, to continue in verse 2 to 3, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does not it seem to you like nothing in comparison? So verse 2, friends, we are just being taught that other than the leaders of the uh, exiled people, the members also were being exhorted. They are being encouraged. The workers who built the foundation, who erected the foundation, they were also being uh, encouraged because they were the ones who stopped building. They were the ones who stopped working. So also, the three rhetorical questions uh, said by uh, Haggai is that the Lord wanted them to understand that in spite of your discouragement, because of the lack of the splendor of the new temple, I'd like you to know that you need to fix your eyes on God. So friends, again, the title of our message, first things first, when discouraged, fix your eyes on God. So when it became full swing already, the, the reconstruction or the rebuilding of the temple, that was the strong message of the Lord, encouragement, especially so to the elders who have seen the old temple and also to the workers. So our role as leaders now is really to encourage some of our elders in the church and also those who are in the ministry, those who are working, that they need to work notwithstanding the difficulties, the discouragement. So through the Temple of Solomon, uh, though the Temple of Solomon was of greater magnificence, the Lord urged the people to be courageous. Because why? When discouraged, fix your eyes on God's presence, God's provision, and number three, God's promises. So Haggai didn't deny that the new temple was as nothing in comparison to what Solomon had built. But nonetheless, 
that wasn't the important thing. The important thing was that this was God's work. Again, we, we should never focus on the tangibles because we need to depend on the power of God. That He will be the one to finish what you have started. That they can depend on His presence, on His provision, on His promises. So let's unpack the three uh, points that I shared in verse 4. But now, take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and also the people of the land. Take courage. Friends, when we read in the Bible, Phrases or words or statement that's repeated three times, that means it's very, very important. Remember, uh, the word, take courage, we can read that, be strong. Those two words would be, would be very significant to the people of Jerusalem. And because that is an assurance of God's presence in what they will be accomplishing. I am with you. In fact, David used these words when he encouraged his son, Solomon, the builder of the first temple. No? In First Chronicles chapter 28, uh, verse 20, Then David said to Solomon, his son, Be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, is what? With you. He will not? Leave you nor forsake you. Until when? Until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Friends, sometimes we forget that when we are in the ministry or when we are doing something that we think na hanggang dito lang yung suporta ng Panginoon sa atin. No! God will be with you until the work is finished. He will begin a good work in you, right? Will complete everything. That's in Philippians, in the book of Philippians. So that's why it is very important to understand the phrase, be strong and courageous. Friends, it became a Jewish culture and tradition. When they hear the word be strong, be courageous, take courage, I will never leave you nor forsake you, it became a tradition or a culture now in the Jewish people that once they hear that, they believe and they know that God will do it. Have I not commanded you, Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you where? Wherever you go. So again, during the Feast of the Tabernacles, remember, no, I shared with you earlier that Haggai gave this message during uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles on the last day. No, The Jews had the book of Deuteronomy read to them. And therefore, they know that ito yung sinabi ng Panginoon kay Moses. That Moses wrote this, no? Be strong and be courageous. And they, in fact, I'm sure that uh, they also read about what Moses told to Joshua. Be strong. Okay? No doubt that they also heard and remember the three times that the Lord, uh, King David, charged Solomon to be strong and be courageous. Again, it's not... <clears throat> It's not an empty phrase. It was an important part of their Jewish history. Be strong and be courageous. Friends, when we are given task, responsibility in the church, in the ministry, or even in your uh, corporate life, sometimes we don't want to accept higher responsibility or bigger responsibility because we are, what? We are afraid that we might fail. We are afraid that we cannot do it. We are afraid that we probably won't be able to complete the task on hand. Because we are, what? We are banking on our abilities. And therefore, we are uh, ano, on our dependability. But God is telling us, it's not you. It's never you. For most of us, when we work in the ministry, in the kingdom, we think that it's ours. We think that akin tui. I started everything. I started this D group. Why should I give them to others? 
dito naman sa company no for the for the uh, corporate people i also uh, had this mentality before if you are familiar with uh, who among you remember baron antena wala ayun yung mga nakabili ng baron antena it's actually not Ernie baron's idea I am an electronics communications engineer by profession. I actually, with the, my friends from ABS-CBN, oh, yun, nasabi ko, nag-plugging, ano, no, we, we, we've designed that antenna. And we were the ones who market that nationwide. I was the head of a national sales and marketing of the company who uh, promote this one. So we were very successful. That's why when I had the problem, uh, mayabang po kasi ako. Kahit maliit po ako, mayabang po ako. And my boss told me that your head is so much bigger that your hat cannot fit your head anymore. And therefore, yun nangyari. I own, sabi ko, ako yan eh. That's mine, that's mine. I would like to take all the credits. But no, I was hired to work for that company. And therefore, I am. Working for that company. It's not mine. The same thing with our ministry. We think that we are the ones uh, doing it or the, uh, and we are the ones making it successful. It's never us. It's never you. It's God. And to continue in Haggai chapter 2, verse 4 to 5, no, I, I, I highlighted it. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. So when I uh, study, it, I go back to this verse and work. It's a, you know, because it's one thing to tell people to be strong and work and quite something else to give them a solid foundation for those words of encouragement. Diba? But Haggai told them why they should be strong and work. Because the Lord was with them. To counteract the discouragement that they were experiencing, the Lord repeated the command to be strong and to work, assuring them of His presence. God's presence is always with you. I am with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Truly, the promise of God's presence was an encouragement to both Joshua and Solomon and also to the people during that time. And believers today can also claim that promise. But you know, work and work. I am with you. Take courage and work. Bakit siningit yun? Then I realized, as St. Augustine said, to work is to pray. There are a lot of times when we go into ministry or anything, for that matter, corporate or otherwise, we fail to pray. But the start of the work, the end of the work, the middle of the work is really praying. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. The work is to pray. Friends, we should pray. Everything that we will decide on, everything that we will do, should be uh, founded, rooted in prayer. And then again, when we pray, we should be very careful. Again, uh, let me share with you my story. Uh, fast forward, I resigned from that company. Then I uh, pursue uh, another endeavor. So when someone called me, would you like to be part of our company? It's a multinational company. Uh, dealing with the uh, cables and etc. So, they offered me a very good package. But back then, I was already uh, talking with my disciple, Pastor Jess, Pastor Jess, I want to go full-time. And yet, hindi uh, pa kami nag decide back then. It's around, I think, 2014 or 2015. So, I entertained uh, offers like that. So, when I was being offered, I said, this is perfect. This is what I want to pursue. This is my dream job. Asia Pacific Regional Office with offices in Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, Korea. So yun ang gusto ko. Wow, yun yun yun, yun yun type ko. No? Lord, sige. If this is your will for me, this is my prayer. I prepared my check- checklist. I wrote down everything <clears throat> that I would like to demand. <clears throat> Excuse me. From that company. So lo and behold, 
when I offered that to the employer, they gave it to me. Lord, sabi ko, Lord, praise God, this is your answered prayer. The position is so high, the job is quite you know, relatively easy. No? Very, ano pa, diba? the perks and the compensation is so good. So I accepted it. Six months down the line, without lowering my salary and my compensation package, from that, I would say, the vice presidential position, parang ginawa po nila akong messenger. And therefore, I hate that. You know, parang, sige, sweldo ka malaki, pero wala kang kwenta. Parang ganon. As if they were saying, wala kang kwenta, umalis ka na. Why? Because I thought at that time, I prayed about this. This is Lord. This is your answer to my prayer. Therefore, I will get it. But that was not God's plan at all in my life. Friends, sometimes when we pray, we ask and write down all our demands, all our supplications. But that is not prayer is all about. Prayer is aligning your will with God's will. Sometimes it's difficult because asking for God's will, it takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of what? Time. Prayer. And I remember, okay, Lord, I will give up and then I will pursue. My prayer is really with your right timing, with your right, uh, 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 your, your will, I will abide. Just like Joshua uh, God told him, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Because sometimes it's so hard to give up our comfortable life pursuing ministry. Diba? Because it's not easy. It's never easy. But God kept on reminding me that I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And this was repeated in Hebrews 13.5. Keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So, going back to Haggai, chapter 2, verse 5. According to the covenant that I made with you when I came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. The promise of God's presence with his people is guaranteed by his unchanging word. Because, as you know, friends, he is a covenant-keeping God. Whenever He promised something, He will do it for you and me. As long as our prayer is aligned with His will. He is the covenant-keeping God. So when, uh, you know, if you remember, when the tabernacle was dedicated Moses, God's presence moved in. For the Lord promised to dwell with His people. You remember the story in Exodus? I hope so. And here, Haggai, when he spoke about this, <clears throat> At the close of the Feast of Tabernacle, His covenant commitment and the Spirit would be with them. As when, when they came out of Egypt, when they were in the wilderness for 40 years, God's presence was with them. <clears throat> it was a very, very good reassurance from God Himself that He will never leave them nor forsake them. And for over nine centuries, when Haggai wrote this, he is still the covenant-keeping God. Right? And that's what he said in Exodus 29.45. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So the same Holy Spirit <clears throat> who enabled Moses and the elders to lead the people uh, out of Egypt would also enable the Jews to finish the rebuilding of that second temple. In fact, Zechariah, who ministered side by side with Haggai, also emphasized the importance of trusting the Holy Spirit for the enablement needed to do God's will. Remember this passage, this verse? Very familiar, Zechariah 4, six. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The Holy Spirit. His presence is the Holy Spirit. 
But I like what A.W. Tozer said. If God were to take the Holy Spirit out of this world, much of what we're doing in our churches would go right on and nobody would know the difference. Wow. Sad. For some, doing church work, in the leadership, <coughs> we probably uh, bank on our abilities, our knowledge, our experiences, and we fail to recognize that we need to trust the Holy Spirit for our enablement needed to carry out God's plan for the church, God's plan for the ministry, God's plan for your personal uh, advancement, God's plan for His glory and honor alone. His presence is what we need. Second point is God's provision. Fix your eyes on God's provision. Very clear. Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. God provided for Solomon's original temple. And definitely, He also provided for Zerubbabel's temple. The Lord assured them that no matter what, in spite of the bad economy, of course, galing sila sa exile, Jerusalem was in ruins. There is no such good economy when a city is in ruins. No? So, it's bad. And their lack of wealth, galing po sila sa ibang ano, lugar, di ba? But he was, God was able to provide all they needed. All they needed. True, the remnant had promises from the government. From, there was a decree from Cyrus and also Darius that they will give money. They will give treasure in the building of the temple. But government grants are limited. And that is not what God wants them to pursue. God owns all the wealth in this world. Even the wealth in the king's treasury of Cyrus and Darius, he owns everything. And he, God, can distribute it as he desires because he is the possessor of all our wealth. We are just a steward of everything that we own in this life. We are just the steward of everything that we possess because God is the possessor of everything. Let us not lose uh, that ano, uh, important rea, ano, truth that God owns everything. And therefore, He exhorted us that my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Friends, every need, not everyone's, not some of your needs, every need of yours According to your ability, according to your talent, according to your skills? No. According to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I like how Charles Spurgeon uh, described the second temple, and I'd like to read this with you. The second temple was never intended to be as magnificent as the first. The first was to be embodiment of the full glory of the dispensation of symbols and types, and was soon to pass away. The Jews were to have a structure that would be sufficient for the purposes of their worship. But they were not again to be indulged with the splendors of the former house that God had built by the hand of Solomon. Had it been God's providence that a temple equally magnificent as the first should be built, it might have been easily accomplished. But in God's providence, it was not arranged that it should be so. Friends, you can always plan. You can always do a lot of things your own way. But God's plan is always the best. And God's provision will always suffice for everything that you need. You need not worry. Diba? Last week, diba? we've heard or we've learned, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Next, the last point is the promises, the promised Messiah and the promised peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Some commentaries say, say that this was an announcement of the coming day of judgment of God 
on all the nations. Just like what uh, happened to Persia when Alexander the Great conquered them, you know, when Alexander the Great uh, defeated them. So it's a foreshadowing. That's what they say. But some say that this goes beyond the historical removal of all these nations. Uh, but it's actually about this nation being subjugated under the kingship, under the rulership of the Messiah, of Jesus. That is about in the end times. That is what to happen in the end times. It's, it actually is catological, you know, if we would say it that way. So it's also being, uh, you know, it's also recorded in Hebrews 12, 26, and his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more, I will what? Shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Friends, shake not only the earth, kasi in Mount Sinai, when uh, Moses got the uh, commandments from God, God shook the, shook the earth. And then from there, the prophecy from Zion, He will shake the heavens and the entire universe. That is what the passage is saying. And if I continue, in verse 27, this expression, expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken. As of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may what? Remain. So friends, everything physical, things that can be shaken, they will all be destroyed. And only eternal things, quote-unquote, that cannot be shaken, the things that cannot be shaken, they will remain. Friends, are you laying up treasures in heaven? The things that cannot be shaken? Or are you laying up treasures on earth? What is your priority right now in your life? Are you spending so much time pursuing laying up treasures on earth rather than laying up treasures in heaven? Because all of these physical things, all the possessions that you have, they will all be destroyed. They will all be destroyed. Only the eternal things will remain. Eternal things. So when we move forward, friends, our mindset should be has is this thing that I'm doing will have an eternal rewards or eternal perspective? So what is the kingdom that cannot be shaken, that will remain? Friends, this is the church, the believers, the body of Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. Again, going back to what Charles Spurgeon said, in the second temple, during the time it should be stand, it should stand, the dispensation of Christ was softly melted into the light of spiritual truth. The outward worship was to cease there. It seems right that it should cease in a temple that had not the external glory of the first. God intended to light up the first beams of the spiritual splendor of the second temple, namely, His true temple, the church. And he would put a sign of decay on the outward and visible in the temple of the first. Yet he declares by his servant Haggai that the glory of the second temple should be greater than the first. Friends, his church is the true temple. Don't you know? Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If you are a believer, if you have Jesus Christ in your life as your master and savior. You are marked by the Holy Spirit and that spirit of <clears throat> God dwells in you. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. How does one become a member of household? Number one, by birth. Second, by adoption. As we know, when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and that believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, Romans 10, 9, and 10, we will be saved. We will be adopted to the household of God. We will be adopted to the body of Christ. We will be adopted to the bride of Christ. That is the church. That is the true temple. The question is, are you part of the true temple? And this temple built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus Himself as the what? Chief cornerstone. You can never go wrong if you are anchored on the chief 
cornerstone. In Him, the whole building is joined together. The whole body of Christ is joined together. We are one body and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit in you? Have you surrendered your life to Christ? Are you part of the God's holy temple? Of God's holy temple? Are you part of the church? Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. That's why we as Christians, as believers, as followers of Christ, we show gratitude. We worship Him. We obey Him. We serve Him. We honor Him. And that's why, that's the beauty of being part of a satellite like here in Eastwood. Saman nyo na po ang gateway. By which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Friends, Romans 12.1 says, Therefore, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Him, which is your spiritual act of worship. What have you been offering to God? What have you been offering to Christ? Are you offering an acceptable service? Have you offered your life to Jesus? Jesus also is the treasure of all nations. So, Haggai 2, 6 and 7, and I will shake all the, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Friends, the treasure of all nations, in the other translation, it says the desire of all nations. No, Some, they think that the desirable things of the nations, the treasure and the wealth of all these nations surrounding Israel, they will come later on in the future, and they will give everything, the desirable things, and offer them a sacrifice. But no. I would seems uh, I, I would seem to prefer that this is the messianic title of Christ. Why? Because here we see that the reference, you no, know, a deliverer from all whom nations ultimately long for. We long for Jesus Christ. Not only is this interpretation supported by the ancient rabbis and the early church, the mention of the word glory in the latter part of the verse suggests a personal reference to the Messiah. The glory of Christ. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and His glory will be seen upon you. The Holy Spirit who is residing in you, that's the glory of God, that's the glory of Christ, that will be seen upon you. And the nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. That's why in verse 9, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. He was not talking about the second temple to be of greater glory than the Solomon's temple. He was talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the latter glory. Remember when he said, you uh, demolish this temple in three days I will rebuild it. He was talking to himself. The resurrected Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, will be resurrected three days after. And that is the latter glory that Haggai was talking about. And not only that, it also pertains to the glory of the millennial temple. The 1,000 years where in Christ and the rest of the believers will reign on this earth. And that will function during Christ's reigns on earth. If you want to know the details of the millennial temple, you read Ezekiel chapter 40 hanggang 48. Nine chapters po yun. No? Makikita nyo po doon how the, new, the millennial temple is described. And also, in this place, it refers to the city of Jerusalem where the Messiah will reign as the Prince of Peace. Again, it's eschatological. Uh, Prince of Peace. But I'd like to uh, read this passage, Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the operative phrase is justified by faith. How are we justified by faith? We are sinners. The reason why the Jews were exiled to Babylon is because they sinned. They disobeyed God. How many of us have disobeyed God? All of us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23. No one is righteous. All have sinned. We are totally depraved. That's why we cannot save ourselves. But through the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saved by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone. And that is the gospel. And that is the gospel. When Adam and Eve sin, the imputed sin is in us. But when Jesus Christ came and died for His chosen people, for His elect, we have, just, we have been justified by faith. The imputed righteousness of Christ is in us. And through Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. Friends, we are all sinners. And therefore, we don't have the fellowship. We lost the fellowship with God when Adam sinned. But because of the reconciling work of Christ, because of His blood on the cross, He purchased the lost fellowship and reconciled us with God the Father. Friends, you are all precious. If you have Christ in your life as your Lord and Savior, you are precious because you have been bought by the precious blood of Christ. And since you have been bought by the precious blood of Christ, please do not, do not shortchange God and do not shortchange your life. You are so precious in the eyes of God because you were bought by the blood of His Christ, by, by the blood of His cross. And therefore, we have been reconciled to Him, to God the Father. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon His shoulder, and His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, what? Prince of Peace. So those who believe on Jesus today have the peace of God. Not only that, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Friends, how is your life now? Are you practicing all of these things? Are you practicing these things in your life? Are you walking by the Spirit? Is the fruit of the Spirit evident or manifest in your, manifested in your life? Think about your life now. You may probably very discouraged now. You may probably be very disappointed now with what's happening in your life. Take heart, friends, because when discouraged, you just need to fix your eyes on God's presence, God's provision, and His promises. Friends, the promise of eternal life is real. And yet, the wrath of God, because of our sinfulness, is also real. Hell is real. If you are not connected to the cross of Christ, if you have not been purchased by the blood of Christ, then think about your life. What are you pursuing? What are your priorities in life? Think. Contemplate. Time is so short. Time is running out. Jesus might come very soon. The, uh, the question now is, are you ready? Are you part of His true temple? Are you part of His church? Are you part of the body of Christ? 
Hmm. Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. And therefore, whenever discouraged, just remember this verse, Hebrews 12.2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand, the right hand of the throne of God. Whenever you are facing troubles in this case, just fix your eyes on Jesus. Your friends, your families, your boss, even your disciples, or even your church leaders, us, we may fail you. But don't look on us. Just fix your eyes on Jesus. Because He is the author and perfecter of our faith. Before we end, I'd like to, for all of us, to open our Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 23 onwards. We will uh, celebrate tonight the Lord's Supper. For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. In verse 28, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, this is a commandment that we remember him, that we celebrate his sinless life, his passion and death on the cross by doing the Lord's Supper. And not only that, on top of that, is that we, when we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes back. Therefore, that's why we are doing this every first Sunday of the month. Kasi last week lang, no, anniversary natin. So, too many things happening. That's why we're doing it now. So, we need to do this as often as we want as open as we think. Because when we do that, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And continuing verse, uh, sorry, verse 27, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Friends, this is a sacred celebration between God, Jesus Christ, and the believers, and the Christians. So if you have not yet surrendered your life to Christ, if you have not given up your life to Him, if you have not confessed with your mouth, and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised Him from the dead, then please do not partake of the Lord's Supper. Okay? Because as mentioned, as I've read, we will be accountable with what we will do. Check first your heart. Know Jesus Christ more before uh, partaking with this celebration. And for those of us who have been believers, part of the church, you know, Christians, and yet, you have sins that you have not confessed yet. And you are not ready, you are not prepared to accept the Lord's Supper. Please do not do so. We will not take it against you. We understand. So, because of this, because of that, I'd like for you, to, for the next uh, three minutes, to just pray. To just pray for the next three minutes. And ask the Lord for forgiveness and also ask the Lord thanking Him that we can partake of this sacred celebration.
we distribute the elements now? Friends, we will all do, do this together at the same time. Just get the, the elements, the, the bread, and the juice. <clears throat> the bread, as we know, represents the body of Christ. And the juice represents the blood of Christ. <clears throat> Na po bang lahat? Is there anyone who has no elements yet? Please raise your hand so we can come up to you. We have someone there. Please uh, give them elements, please. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate this Lord's Supper. That we, Lord, <clears throat> as your adopted sons, as your adopted children, that we can come to you and celebrate, Lord God, and remember your sinless life that you live in your passion, in your death, in your ministry as well as your resurrection from the dead three days after. Father, thank you that we can proclaim to everyone, that we can proclaim to the world by remembering you with this Lord's Supper on them until you come back. Thank you, Lord, that we have this privilege, that we have this opportunity to partake of the bread of my partake of the juice, the elements that symbolizes the elements that symbolize your, bo your body, the body of Christ, and His blood. So, if you have your bread with you, you may raise it as we pray for it. <clears throat> Lord, <clears throat> thank you, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for purchasing us from the penalty of sin. Thank you, Lord God, that it is finished, that our salvation is secure in eternity because we are your chosen. We are your elect. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Father, thank you that we can remember you, your life, your passion and your death. Thank you, Lord God. And as we, Lord, break the bread, we pray, Father, that you will bless this. You may now uh, take the bread. <clears throat> Let's pray for the Jews. Father, thank you. Thank you for the blood of Christ. His blood on the cross. Build on the cross, Lord God, 2,000 years ago. Because of His atoning sacrifices on the cross, Lord God, we are declared righteous. 
we are justified by faith. Thank you, Lord God, that the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross made us your sons and daughters. If we have confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised Him from the dead. And we declare that, Lord God, now. Thank you, Lord God, for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We may now drink from the cup. Oh, Lord God, indeed, what a magnificent and marvelous way to celebrate the Lord's Supper together with fellow believers. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross and resurrected again. And that, Lord God, we are all looking forward to the time that we can do this and we can celebrate this with you in the future. Thank you, Father, for that assurance. Thank you, Lord God, for the gift of eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for our salvation. Father, it is our prayer now that we will be able to live our lives according to our calling, according to our salvation. Lord, may we continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And that, Lord God, we will walk by the Spirit. We will, Lord, abide by the Spirit. Lord, I pray for the group of people here who have not yet surrendered their lives to Christ. That, Lord, may this be the day that they will confess and believe that Jesus is Lord. That God raised Him from the dead. May they take this opportunity to do that and to declare that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And I also pray, Lord God, for the group of people here who are struggling in their priorities in life and that they don't know yet the meaning of God's presence, provision, and promises. Lord, I pray for each one of them that you will continue to reveal yourselves to them, that you will continue to declare your majesty in their lives, that you will declare your magnificence in their lives, that you will continue to work in their everyday lives. Father, may we all be trusting and fully dependent on you. And that, Lord God, may we all fully depend on the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we all pray. Amen and amen. Good evening, everyone.